All right, we're going to talk about uh, GI alterations. And to start with, here are the objectives for today. I'll let you uh, review those at your leisure. Remember that when we do a GI assessment, we always start with auscultation. I suppose you could start with inspection, but the idea here is to put auscultation first so you remember not to start mashing on the belly before you listen. And the reason is that when you mash on the belly by palpating or percussing, um, you're going to potentially mess up the bowel sounds and make them more active than they really are. Um, GI bleeding is probably what we see uh, most of all that we're going to talk about here. It's probably what we see most. It's certainly the most um, exciting um, of all the things that we see in um, critical care. So in terms of what bleeds, um, remember there's the upper GI bleeds and the lower GI bleeds. So the top uh, part or the upper GI bleeds tend to produce uh, bright red blood uh, out of the mouth and the lower GI bleeds tend to produce bright red blood uh, out of the rectum. And of course the um, upper GI bleeds that uh, get to the bottom are dark, tarry, because that blood has already been uh, digested in the GI tract. So a couple of things to remember uh, in terms of incidence and prevalence. Um, in the ICU, about 20 to 30 percent of these are uh, of, of these upper GI bleeds are duodenal ulcers. Um, about 20 or 30 percent are gastric uh, or duodenal erosions. And then varices, which certainly are the most um, uh, problematic to deal with, uh, of the GI bleeds are 15 to 20 percent uh, in general. Lower GI bleeds are not as uh, common in the critical care unit because they're typically not as serious. They're not as dramatic. Um, although certainly you can lose a lot through an EVM or something like that, they tend not to be as big. And if you look at some of the things here, you know, we're talking about carcinomas, they bleed chronically, but not, you know, um, a ton all at once. Uh, and then diverticular disease certainly can be a problem. And then hemorrhoids, you know, these are little bleeders. The big ones are the varices. So signs and symptoms of GI bleeds, the upper GI bleeds, again, I mentioned it earlier, uh, hematemesis, heme meaning blood, emesis meaning vomitus. Uh, so the hematemesis, coffee ground emesis, uh, and again, melana, which is the dark tarry stools, because the blood is being digested as it goes through the GI tract and comes out the rectum. Lower GI bleeds tend to have brighter blood or what we call hematochesia. Now with any GI bleed, when you get um, anemic, you become tachycardic, hypotensive, uh, and you can potentially have hypovolemic shock. These patients can lose a, a ton of blood with upper GI bleeds in particular. So this is a, um, a upper GI bleed management algorithm. Uh, these are the uh, treatments that we tend to prefer. We like large bore IVs, right? We got to get a lot of fluid and perhaps blood products into this patient right away. Um, supplemental oxygen as needed. Of course, if the oxygen level uh, is, you know, if they're saturated 98%, adding oxygen isn't really going to do much, but at the same time, it doesn't hurt. So what the heck, right? Um, we treat hypotension initially with rapid bolus infusions of uh, crystalloid, right? So saline, or as we've learned more recently from a uh, a couple of articles in the New England Journal within the past year, uh, we really like, instead of uh, saline, we really like lactated ringers more. Patients who get fluid resuscitation with LR tend to have fewer um, uh, episodes of renal failure. All right, I'll let you read through the rest of this on your own. I certainly don't need to read it to you. Now, for these um, really nasty upper GI bleeds, particularly from bleeding varices, 
Um, the standard today is to do a upper endoscopy or a esophago gastro duodenoscopy EGD and put a, uh, scope down into the stomach and into the esophagus and perhaps I should say into the esophagus and into the stomach, right? That's the order it goes in. So we put the scope down in there and we look for the bleeders. And then if there is a bleed, they can oftentimes, um, do a procedure where they snare that bleed and they, um, they can, um, cauterize it or they can, um, uh, ligate it with a, a stitch of some sort and stop the bleeding that way. Sometimes, it's a mess in there and there are multiple bleeds and it's gushing out and you can't identify what to do. And in that case, what we try to do is tamponade the flow of blood. And one particular tool to do that is uh, a thing called a Minnesota tube or a Sengstaken Blakemore tube, which is shown here. Now you're probably wondering what the heck's the football helmet for? Well, this is part of the tube. This is how you do it. So if you look at this um, image, here you can see that the tube goes down through the nose and into the esophagus and then further down into the stomach and there are two balloons that are on it one's pictured here one's pictured here and of course we have all these different um, lumens through which to do things we can suction we can uh, instill lavage we can uh, inflate these balloons, etc. And so one of these balloons is in the stomach and the other one is in the esophagus. And these balloons get inflated, that tamponades the blood flow, hopefully, and um, allows the blood to clot so that later we can uh, go down in there with the endoscopy and uh, find these specific bleeders and fix them. Now, the thing about these balloons is that when they're inflated in there, they don't stay there. They tend to want to uh, do like a watermelon seed, right? And they tend to go um, straight down into the stomach. And that's what the balloon, uh, or that's what the football helmet is for. So we attach the tube, once it's in the nose, to the football helmet uh, mask. And that keeps traction on the uh, Minnesota tube so that it can't come out. There's a video here for you to click on and you can view that and see more details about it. So that's for an upper GI bleed. Again, very common for esophageal varices, which you've learned about already. Uh, lower GI bleed management is uh, a little less exciting, right? We tend to manage it because it's really hard to get something in there to fix the bleed. And as I mentioned earlier, the, you know, these don't tend to be aggressive bleeders. Um, you can lose blood, but we can typically keep up with it with fluid resuscitation and uh, blood products, etc. The other thing is that um, we can sometimes do a colonoscopy to go in there and look for uh, for these lesions, and that can be done at the bedside. Now, the problem with colonoscopy at the bedside, well, let me talk about the upper endoscopy. When you do the EGD or upper endoscopy at the bedside, um, we can do that without any uh, prep. With the lower endoscopy, um, you really need good prep in order to do that procedure. So um, we have to clean out the gut and the colon has to be uh, visible. If you have um, stool that sticks to the side, then things may get hidden and we might not be able to see the bleeding but, uh, or, or whatever the lesion is that we're concerned with. Nursing care of these patients who are undergoing the procedure, of course, we um, monitor their vital signs during the procedure. Uh, and then every five minutes um, for about 15 minutes, and then every 15 minutes for uh, a period of time. Um, and then, you know, just back to the regular critical care monitoring. So of course we have cardiac monitoring in place. We have oxygen, making sure that the airway is patent, uh, end tidal CO2, uh, is important uh, to make sure that we're, uh, that we don't have any, um, uh, interference with the, um, airway. And then of course we do conscious sedation and, um, that just keeps patients comfortable during the procedure. Another thing that we 
can use is this thing called a capsule endoscopy. There's a video here for you to watch too, if you click on the YouTube link there. With the capsule endoscopy, this is particularly good. So we have a we have something that we can do to look in the stomach and esophagus and even into the duodenum a little bit. Uh, and that's the EGD. We also have a test that we can do to visualize the colon, um, which is the colonoscopy. What we don't have a good way of visualizing is the small bowel. And that's really where the pill cam comes in handy because we can uh, either have the patient swallow this or in the critical care unit, obviously, um, oftentimes we instill it. Uh, or, or insert it through an EGD scope. Uh, and that cam goes down in the uh, stomach and into the duodenum and makes, it way, makes its way through the small bowel. That's the thing that we're looking for. Are there AVMs in the small bowel that are potentially causing the bleeding? Um, you know, how do we do that? So the patient has this pill that goes through them. There's a... Um, uh, telemetry hookup with a, I guess it's worn on the belt or in a little pack, uh, that the patient keeps with them. And the pill cam just sends the video directly to this little, um, telemetry pack, and then it can be, uh, evaluated or looked at with a, um, uh, with a computer to view the actual still images. One of the things that we might find um, when we have a patient in the critical care unit is uh, ischemic bowel. This is a really severe uh, problem. Now we're off of the GI bleeds now and we're talking about other um, potential complications, uh, GI complications of uh, uh, that we see in the critical care unit. And Dead gut is a um, very, very, very serious problem, and it's very hard to uh, fix this. The reason that it's such a big problem is that when the gut dies, it produces a ton of acid, a ton of lactic acid, that is. And so patient, these patients are super sick. Um, they are um, they're, they're very acidemic and it's hard to keep up. Um, the only fix for this is a surgical fix where they have to take out a large portion of the gut. Um, sometimes and successfully at Hershey, I've seen them stent these, um, uh, parts of the gut. If the ischemia is due to, um, vascular disease, but if it's due to, trauma or uh, hypercoagulable state or cirrhosis of the liver or other reasons, um, then this severe, uh, th this ischemic bowel can be um, really deadly actually. The patients present with a very acute abdomen. It is the most severe abdominal pain imaginable. Um, you can't touch their belly. It is board-like. Uh, you know, flat, board-like, distended abdomen. Um, not flat. I don't know why I said flat, but board-like, distended abdom, uh, abdomen. And when I say board-like, I mean it is hard as a rock. You will never mistake this anytime that you see it. Uh, board-like abdomen is a surgical emergency. So these patients oftentimes um, show signs of septic shock. Uh, and the reason for that is that they have all the stuff lined up with uh, a septic reaction, right? The SIRS response, the systemic inflammatory response um, is terrific. They have fever, they get hypotensive, they get tachycardia, uh, and then the lactate levels are elevated as well. So they go into the operating room, they take out the dead gut, uh, and they try and fix the cause of ischemia uh, if possible. But, you know, you have to have your gut to live. You have to be able to digest food um, and, you know, uh, support the microbiome that lives in the gut, uh, which we're beginning to realize has major implications for health. Um, so you can't live without your small bowel. Uh, you can live without a couple feet of it, but you can't live without the whole thing. 
Um, sometimes patients end up with a perforation in the bowel or in the colon or in the stomach or wherever. And what happens then is the contents of the gut leak out into the peritoneal space. Then you get peritonitis, which is um, also uh, very, very painful. And this has to be dealt with um surgically as well. So risk factors for gut perforation or GI tract perforation include trauma, obviously, right? Penetrating trauma in particular, but also uh, blunt trauma. Um, you can have a car accident, you know, at high velocity that uh, causes shear forces that um, cause tearing and things like that in the gut. Um, foreign bodies vomiting can actually cause something called Mallory Weiss tears, which is a tear in the esophagus from the uh, force of the vomiting. Appendicitis, peptic, uh, uh, peptic ulcer disease, uh, cancers, all of these can be risk factors for uh gut perforation. And then of course we see perforations anywhere along the, um, uh, the GI tract, whether it's esophagus or all the way down to the, uh, sigmoid colon and the rectum can happen anywhere along there. And of course, most recent anastomoses or even chronic anastomoses can, uh, can be a problem. So I know a patient who had a, um, who had gastric bypass surgery. So we had this, um, you know, tiny pouch that was made that then got attached to the small bowel. And when that happened, um, you know, that's the way the surgery is done, right? That's, that's the whole idea of bypassing the duodenum, uh, and the bigger part of the stomach. The problem is that this, um, uh, there was a hole that eroded through between the little pouch that was made and the old remnant stomach. And so there was a, a, a fistula there, a hole between those two um, things. Now it didn't open up into the peritoneum, uh, but this guy got really sick as a result of it. And um, it was one of those unusual findings that uh, we talked about for months afterwards. Well, we still talk about it. I'm telling you about it. Patients who present with GI tract perforation also have very severe acute abdominal pain. Um, rigid abdomen, that is that board-like abdomen that we talked about. Uh, so the presentation is very, very similar to ischemic gut, and um, it's often a, also a surgical emergency. The one um, thing that we look for when we do an x-ray or a CT scan is free air in the abdomen. You're not supposed to have free air in the abdomen. So if air pops up uh, in the belly, then that typically means that there's a perforation. Of course, the perforation could be because of could be because of ischemic gut, uh, so we have to take that into consideration too. But uh, but this is a very very serious condition as well. Um, if untreated, it leads to sepsis and um, death. So antibiotics are a big part of this, and then uh, uh, exploratory laparotomy and fix the problem. Um, again, you know, it's often some other issue that has caused this perforation, whether it's an ulcer in the uh, stomach or the um, duodenum, or whether it's an old anastomosis site um, that has uh, dehissed th the the, the risks are um, identifiable ahead of time, and then we can figure out how to treat it in the operating room. The next thing we'll talk about is fulminant liver failure. So fulminant means severe and sudden. Um, fulminant, that word, combines those two traits. It, it is severe and sudden. And so fulminant liver failure um, is a severe liver injury that... Uh, can happen for a couple of reasons that we'll talk about soon. Um, typically, the uh, severe liver injury is accompanied by encephalopathy, right? So if you remember uh, from 405B, when the uh, liver is working correctly, its job is to take 
NH3, that is ammonia, which is a byproduct of protein metabolism, and it combines ammonia, the liver combines the ammonia with CO2, which makes BUN, right? And then the BUN goes to the kidneys and gets flushed out there. If you have a broken liver, your liver is not able to make BUN, and as a result, the NH3 flies around uh, in your bloodstream, goes to your brain, and makes your brain stop working. And that hepatic encephalopathy happens very quickly with um, with fulminant liver failure. Um, my wife has done uh, a number of uh, psychiatric assessments on patients who are awaiting liver transplant. Whenever you get transplanted, whether it's a heart, a liver, kidney, lung, whatever, you need um, a psychiatric evaluation to make sure that, you know, the patient understands what they're doing, uh, you know, what's being suggested. You have to make sure that they consent to it and they usually get psychiatry to do that. So my wife gets involved in some of these and she said that liver failure, they all hate doing liver failure evaluations. The reason is when you're in liver failure, your brain doesn't work. And she said it can take hours and hours and hours to do these uh, evaluations because the patient's brain just doesn't work. They can't answer questions. Uh, They fall asleep in the middle. They uh, are are very, very difficult to, um, to interview. The other thing that we see in fulminant liver failure is an elevated INR. Now let's think about that for a second. So the most sensitive test for liver failure is not the AST, not the ALT. Those are elevated acutely, but not chronically. So anybody who has liver failure should have an elevated pro time now. And why do they have an elevated pro time? Well, let's think about that. So the liver's job, among other things, is to make proteins, right? One of the big proteins that the liver makes, uh, or a series of the proteins that the liver makes, uh, are the clotting proteins. And since the liver is broken when you're in liver failure, it can't make those proteins. And as a result, your bleeding tendency goes up And we measure that with the prothrombin time or the PT. Uh, We normalize that for everybody in the world with the INR. So the INR, PT, those are uh, both synonymous in this case. So anytime that you're looking at somebody and concerned whether they might have liver failure, a very, very good, um, in fact, the best the most sensitive test for uh, liver failure, whether it's a chronic one or uh, or an acute one, is the ProTime or the INR. Now, what else can cause the ProTime and INR to be elevated? Coumadin, of course, right? Um, or uh, bleeding disorders, you know, like hemophilia. Um, so there are some things where that's not a great test because you have to m- interpret it with other uh, stuff on board, but, um, but you know, without any of those confounders, the pro time is a very, very, very good, um, sensitive marker for liver failure. Um, with fulminant liver failure, there has to be a, uh, an absence of pre-existing liver disease or cirrhosis. Remember this is acute onset with severe ramifications, Uh, And the more severe the encephalopathy, the poorer the prognosis is. So how do people get fulminant liver failure? Well, it can be viral um, or also drug-induced. And Tylenol or acetaminophen is one of the big ones. And there was a patient at Hershey Medical Center um, a couple of years ago who had uh, MS and this is a very sad story. Um, she was a mom. She was, I don't know, in her 30s. And she had MS and um, had a lot of pain and didn't want to take narcotics. And she said, well, Tylenol is over the counter, so I can just use that. And that's exactly what she did. But she used such an amount of it, more than four grams a day, which, by the way, four grams of acetaminophen per day, you should know, uh, uh, in excess of four grams a day is, um, liver toxic, hepatotoxic. So never, ever give, uh, 
acetaminophen that totals more than four grams in a day. And remember, it's not just the acetaminophen that you're giving, but also uh, the other medicines that are combined with acetaminophen. So the total intake of acetaminophen can never exceed four grams a day. Um, so this patient actually took tons of Tylenol, uh, tried to improve her pain with that, and instead ended up giving herself fulminant liver failure. She did not survive. Um, she left her uh, family behind. And um, I mean, everybody was just so upset about this. She didn't try to poison herself. Uh, she thought she was doing something good by avoiding narcotics. And instead, she, um, she didn't realize that even over-the-counter medicines uh, can be very, very dangerous. Um, other causes of acute liver failure uh, are listed here from this up-to-date article. Um, never forget that mushrooms, first of all, mushrooms are gross, don't you think? I mean, they're fungus. I don't know who wants to eat these things, but uh, every year there are a certain number of Americans who are poisoned by mushrooms uh, that they find in their backyard or in the woods or something like that. Um, it's not a zero. Uh, it, the, the number of people who are affected is not zero. There is definitely a, a, a number of people every year who get liver failure from eating mushrooms, which you will never see me dying from liver failure because I think mushrooms are disgusting. Um, there are some other diseases here. So hepatitis, um, uh, CMV, which is, you know, cytomegalovirus, uh, many drugs and other toxins that are out there, uh, hypoperfusion. So if you have somebody who has, um, severe shock, whether it's septic shock or whatever else, we see sometimes uh, hepatitis as a result of that. Hepatitis in general just means uh, inflammation of the liver, and that can be because of ischemia, can be because of an infectious agent, or what have you. Clinical manifestations of liver failure are shown here. So you probably um, your eye probably goes to the yellow color of uh, this gentleman's skin and um, his sclera as well. Actually, it's not the sclera. It's actually the conjunctiva that are yellow. The conjunctiva cover the hard white sclera. Um, but this is jaundice. And this happens when too much bilirubin is present in the blood uh, and can't get out through the bile system. Um Coagulopathies often happen as well. And here you can see some uh, petechiae from somebody who has uh, a coagulopathy. And again, the coagulopathy happens because the uh, liver makes the clotting factors. And when the liver's broken, the clotting factors don't get made, right? Um, you may see hepatic encephalopathy very frequently. The belly here shows ascites. And one thing I want to be that I want to point out to you, hopefully you can see this on your slide deck. Um, you can see these big veins that are popping out here. That's very typical of, um, uh, ascites. Now it's also typical in pregnancy, but in particular ascites tends to bring this out. Um, pruritus or itching is a big deal with, um, um, hepatitis and liver failure, uh, nausea, vomiting, and a lot of anorexia. People just don't feel like eating. Uh, all of these things go along with, um, uh, liver failure and lethargy is of course due to the elevated, uh, levels of, uh, ammonia. Diagnostic tests, as I pointed out, an elevated PT or INR is the most sensitive of all the tests. We can also measure ammonia levels. And then we look at, AS, uh, at LFTs. And the LFTs include the increased AST, ALT, and bilirubin. The ALT and AST are um, uh, the most sensitive liver enzymes. And ALT is by far more sensitive than AST. Typically in all, I'm pretty sure this is accurate, in all the um, uh, liver failures, the ALT 
is higher than the AST, with one exception, and that is alcohol. When alcohol causes the liver failure, the AST is higher than the ALT. Now, the AST is produced in other places, not just the liver, um, and so that may be the reason. Um, bilirubin is different, though. So bilirubin is, if you recall, the end product of the breakdown of red blood cells. And so the bilirubin has to um, uh, be recycled, at, I'm sorry, it has to be excreted through the kidneys uh, or into the bile. Those are the two choices for it. The kidneys can handle very much of it. They can handle a little bit, but not a whole lot of it. Most of it needs to get put into the bile. And when the bile empties uh, from the liver, it goes into the gallbladder and then down the bile duct. Uh, and that's what makes your poop brown, right? That's, uh, that's part, of the, uh, part of what happens to make your poop brown. And it also uh, helps to manage the... Um, pH of the stool, and it has a whole host of other things that it does too. Um, the BMP or the basic metabolic panel uh, it needs to be monitored for these patients too, but essentially we never do that. We always change it to a, a, a complete metabolic panel or a CMP because that includes all this stuff over here. It includes the AST, the ALT, the bilirubin, also the albumin. Why is, an al why is albumin associated with liver failure? Well, again, the, um, the liver is what makes the proteins. And one of the proteins, in fact, the most uh, prevalent protein in the bloodstream is albumin. So we see decreased albumin levels uh, in these patients as well. Uh, anemia, uh, anemia workup, and then toxicology is also done to determine the cause of the uh, liver failure. Complications of liver failure, of course, uh, are many. Uh, acute kidney injury because of the bilirubin uh, can be a problem. Um, pulmonary complications because of uh, uh, buildup of fluids and... Um, uh, just a host of other problems, bleeding because of the uh, lack of clotting factors that are manufactured by the liver, peritonitis because of inflammation uh, caused by the liver, and then chronic renal failure can result. If you can get the patient through the acute renal, uh, I'm sorry, the acute liver failure phase, then chronic liver failure can be a problem as well. So how do we treat these patients? Well, um, we try, of course, to prevent any of those problems. Uh, and then we have to get on it early uh, in terms of bleeding. We, you know, we have to make sure that we provide the clotting factors if the body can't make it itself. And how do we do that? Can you think of a blood product that we would give that would have the clotting factors in it? FFP, right? FFP, also cryoprecipitate. Um, those are a couple of them. Um, and then all of the other things that we see listed here are done as well. For those patients who have um, liver failure due to uh, ingestion of excess Tylenol uh, or acetaminophen, we use uh, acetylcysteine injections that um, try and bind the um, toxic metabolites from the acetaminophen. So this actually works by breaking the, um, uh, the bonds that make the acetyl, uh, that make the acetaminophen, uh, and it, um, helps to get rid of the stuff in a, the, the, of the acetaminophen in a non-toxic way. Now, sometimes that's not sufficient. And if that happens, um, then, you know, sometimes transplant has to be dealt with urgently, uh, in the, uh, in the critical care unit. And if that patient can't get a liver, then we have a couple other tricks up our sleeve, but they don't typically work very well. Um, in fact, in one series that I was looking at before I uh, did this lecture for you, they had 28 patients in this series who got um, the fake liver, or the artificial liver called Mars that we'll talk about later. Uh, and of those 28, 
uh, not one of them had a, a shorter length of stay in the ICU, and it was uh, it, it was not a great outcome for uh, for most of those patients because you know Mother Nature did it best, right? Another thing that we often do, remember there's this ton of, um, of fluid that builds up with the ascites. So in the gut, you have this overwhelming amount of fluid in the gut in the peritoneal space. And so sometimes we have to get that out just to relieve symptoms for the patient. Um, the reason that this fluid when it comes out has all this um, frothy stuff at the top and the yellow liquid in here is because this is protein. This is albumin. That's the problem when you take all this stuff out. Um, this is largely protein uh, and, and in particular albumin. And so a couple of things are true. One, we hate to see uh, all that albumin not in the intravascular space. Uh, and the second thing that we get concerned about is, you know, it's going to reaccumulate right away. There's very, very little that we can do uh, to keep that from reaccumulating. One thing that we can do is put in a shunt, right? Do a uh, hepatoportal shunt where we shunt the blood from the, um, uh, from the portal vein system uh, directly into the vena cava. And when we do that, that should relieve the pressure, uh, in the gut and decrease the amount of ascites. Um, you'll talk about that in 405 B as well. All right. I promised to show you the Mars system. Mars stands for molecular adsorbent recirculating system. This is essentially dialysis for the liver. Um, it doesn't produce, uh, you know, so remember all the other things that the liver does. It doesn't just get rid of bilirubin. It also, um, the liver, the real liver also produces clotting factors. It also helps digest food. It is responsible for cholesterol synthesis and storage glycogen. And those things, this Mars system doesn't do. Essentially what this Mars system does is it gets rid of, gets rid of bilirubin. So is it any wonder that it's not the magic um, solution that we hope that it would be? Um, it doesn't really, um, it seems, affect the outcome uh, as much as we would hope that it would. So that's what you should know about um, liver failure and other GI problems uh, to be an awesome critical care nurse.